Hello. <laughs> it does work. <laughs> um, let me just bend over here. Uh, so this program is being live streamed. A special thank you to our live stream sponsor, WGLT, Bloomington Normals Public Media, part of the NPR network. Hello and welcome to our program. Um, Untold African American Stories, Ava Carol Monroe and the Lincoln Colored Home. Um, this is an Illinois Humanities Road Scholars Speakers Bureau event, um, and it's being hosted also by the Bloomington Public Library and the McLean County Museum of History. Uh, the mission of the Illinois Humanities is to activate the humanities through free public programs, grants, and educational opportunities that foster reflection, spark conversation, build community, and strengthen civic engagement throughout the state. Our Rhodes Scholars Speakers Bureau supports that mission by inviting Illinois authors, artists, and scholars to share their expertise and enthusiasm with people and communities throughout our state. After this event, we hope you'll complete the audience feedback survey, which will help us as we plan our future programs and seek support for our work. Um, that is also available online. We're gonna post it in the chat box, and we're gonna put it in the uh, program description on our YouTube channel. Um, to learn more about the Rhodes Scholars presentations, our other programs, and our great opportunities, please visit ilhumanities.org. We hope you enjoy this presentation. I'd like to present Mary Frances as our presenter. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. I appreciate your attendance here today. I'd like to start out by finding out who you are and where you, where you, where you live and what brought you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You do. That's right. You do. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Are you the president of the NAACP in Bloomington? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Tammy Kirkland. I live in Normal, and uh, I just have the uh, love of African American history. And I saw that, and I thought, oh my goodness, the color home. And this is about orphans. We talk about it, everybody else. Mm -hmm. but, uh, All right, thank you. Thank you for coming. My name is Laura. I'm from Mexico and I live in San Francisco. So I am here because I love my friends and I just like to be with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Mears. I'm the director of school education and I'm in my teacher. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is my book, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. 
And it is for sale downstairs on the ground floor. And I will do a book signing after the presentation if any of you are interested in buying it. And today I'm going to talk about three different things. And the first thing is three photos in my book that are related to the Lincoln Color Home and Eva Carol Monroe. And the second thing is I'm going to give information about Kiwani, Illinois. And it's going to be based on a documentary film I made, again, about the Lincoln Colored Home. And then third, I'm going to give you more in-depth information about the Lincoln Colored Home um, in Springfield. Now, has anyone actually, I know you've been to the home, right? Is it? OK. Has anyone else actually seen the house outside? Just one person? OK, great. <clears throat> So this is a picture from my book, and this is Dr. Webster, and he was a dentist for 40 years in Springfield, and his professional work, his office was located on the east side of Springfield, which was primarily African American. Um, he did serve white people also, and his career spanned from around the late or the early 1930s to the 1960s. And I found out in my research, when I was looking at some medical records related to the orphans at the colored home, that it was Dr. Webster who did the initial dental exams when the orphans came into the home. So this was in the early 1930s, right before the home closed in around 1933. <clears throat> so I saw his notes and the diagnoses that he made on the kids. Most of it was cavities that they had. And sadly, that was about all the dental um, attention that they got. They didn't have the resources to get to fix any of the cavities or any of the dental problems. It, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Webster was known for helping youth in the community. And this is Charles Grandy, and he was a Civil War veteran. And Mr. Grandy was dedicated to the Grand Army of the Republic, which is the GAR, which was formed right after the Civil War ended. And he would travel to their annual encampments in different places throughout the United States. And this picture was taken I think around 1939, and he would have been around 98 years old. Yeah, so he was, he was traveling for a long time. He was, stationed, he was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, which was his home at the time he died. And we didn't know anything about Mr. Grandy, so I got most of my information from all these medals here on his jacket. And I was able to find out um, three different encampments that he attended, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Washington, DC. And he came to Springfield twice for encampments. And one of the times he came in 1932, he went to the Lincoln Colored Home. And so he would have met Eva Carol Monroe and they raised a flag while he was there. And he gave a poetic talk about Abraham Lincoln and you know, how that we should honor him. And we should also honor the Civil War veterans. And on Memorial Day, we should go out and put um, flowers on their graves. It was, it was a very moving speech. This is James Lewis. And he was from Chicago, and he was another Civil War veteran. He joined in 1863. And when he got out of the Civil War, he went back to his home in Chicago, and he enrolled in a law school, which is now Northwestern University College of Law. And he received a law degree. But he, too, was devoted to the Grand Army of the Republic, and he would travel and um, go to the different encampments throughout the country. 
I'm not sure where this picture was taken. I want to say it was Springfield. I wish it was. I'm not sure if he, uh, if he went to the Lincoln Colored Home or not. But the reason I have him here is that Eva Carol Monroe mentions him in a talk that she gave, and she wanted to name a post after him in Decatur. She was going to create a new post for the, um, the Women's Relief Corps, and name it after James Lewis. So that's his connection. Now, unfortunately, I could not include an actual photo of the Lincoln Colored Home in my book. I wanted to. And the Dana Thomas House has an original photo of an elderly black woman standing behind the Lincoln Colored Home. It's an old black and white photo. But I could not get permission to use it. So I don't have any actual pictures of the home in my book. So this is what I think the house where Eva Carol Monroe's family lived in Kiwani, at least for a period of time. I can't verify it 100%, but I think that's the one. And they, um, they moved to Kiwani from uh, Stark Township in Illinois. And Eva's father was a coal miner. He was also a Civil War veteran. And he eventually had, I believe, eight daughters and one son who died early. And they lived in different um, places in Kiwani. And um, do you recognize this area here? OK, she's from Kiwani. So <laughs> do you recognize this house? This is on Cutters Avenue, just south of South Street. So I believe that Eva and her siblings would have attended Irving School in Kiwani. And this doesn't still stand, does it? Uh, it's still there. OK. OK. Now, if they attended school, and I'm saying if because Legally, around that time in the 1870s, there was a time when they weren't legally allowed to go to white schools. But I think it was around 1874, they passed a law in Illinois where it became, the schools became integrated. And Eva and her siblings would have been able to go to a white school. So Richard Carroll is Eva's father. And he was doing a lot of different jobs to support his large family. And at one point, he started his own laundry business. And it was located, um, I believe it was located in his house, but he would do laundry and advertise it at Staples Shoe Store in downtown Kiwani. And amazingly, this says Staples right here. So this is the actual shoe store where he would have been advertising the laundry. So this is an original photo of Kiwani. Does this look familiar at all to you? <laughs> okay. And then for a period of time, he was a porter. And a porter is someone who handles uh, luggage and so forth for people at a hotel. So this was the Kiwani House Hotel. Is this still there? It's a, well, we do have a hotel in Decatur. It's not OK. OK. So that was pretty much the life in Kiwani. There was some moving around, um, establishing his family. And then eventually, they moved to Macomb, Illinois. Eva's mother died when she was around 12 years old, when Eva was 12 years old. And her mother was only in her 30s. And when I did the research, um, Mary Carroll did not have a gravestone. So I was able to get her a gravestone. 
was able to finance that. So now she has a marked grave. And by the way, that is the case I find with a lot of my subjects and my research, especially the black women do not have gravestones. Even Eva Carol Monroe didn't have a gravestone when I started my research. But I was able to get her a gravestone also at Oak Ridge Cemetery. Now, Eva's father, Richard Carroll, did have a gravestone because he was a Civil War veteran, and the federal government provided those stones for free for veterans. And so he's buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield. So after Eva's mother died, um, her father remarried a couple years later when she was probably about 14, and then about two years went by when she had a stepmother, and she herself married when she was around 16 or 17. And this is the marriage certificate. She married a man named Emmett Trice. So conceivably, she probably left home around the age of 16 or 17 with about seven younger siblings still at home. Now, Eva had one daughter. She had one child that I know of, and her name was Beatrice. And Beatrice had, uh, I would say, a, a kind of a troubled childhood. She was involved with drugs and uh, stealing. And eventually, Eva sent her to a girls' reformatory school in Geneva, Illinois. And at that time, it was a extremely rough place to be. There were uh, torture allegations against the white female director of the school who eventually had to resign. But Beatrice made it out of there and she went to Milwaukee and she got a marriage license to marry a white man. Now, can you imagine what happened when <laughs> she tried to do this? This was in the 1920s in Milwaukee when the KKK was at its peak, especially in Milwaukee. Okay, so. So Friday night before the wedding, the KKK placed a cross at her fiance's house and at Beatrice's house, and they lit them both at the same time and burned the crosses and this was actually a huge event for the KKK. It ended up attracting 800 people for a rally that same evening. And they had uh, a national KKK director come to the meeting. They brought in new members that evening. They had prominent people from the community speak at the meeting, pastors, insurance brokers, yeah, it was pretty bad. So can you guess what happened to that marriage? The marriage license? Yeah, it didn't happen. It did not. As tough as Beatrice was, she, they did not follow through on that one. Mm-hmm. You have them. Do you have the microphone that he can? Yeah. Just so they can hear your question on the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> the live stream needs it. Yeah. <clears throat> if I interpreted it correctly, the previous uh, newspaper article seemed to suggest that it was common for a white woman to marry a a black man, mm -hmm. but not the reverse. Right. So does the, that doesn't suggest that the Ku Klux Klan would have been any happier if the genders were reversed? That's a great question. I don't know the answer, because I don't know how many incidents they had there. But this was the first license for a black woman trying to marry a white man in, in Milwaukee. Thank you for those questions.
All right, so now I'm just going to move on to the Lincoln Colored Home. And this is a, a, an old map, I think around 1867. And Eva chose a neighborhood on the east side of town that was just developing. And she was at 427 12th Street, and she decided to buy this building right here. And I believe that is the actual building on this drawing. To live there and to create this home for black orphans and uh, elderly women. And this is a, a newer map, and you can see this is a Sanborn fire insurance map, so you can see it over here. So this was Capitol Avenue, which would have led straight to the Illinois, the new Illinois State Capitol building. So it wasn't too far from downtown. And a residential area, although there were businesses here, you can see we have a bombs, stone and marble, <clears throat> stone and marble works. There were churches here, grocery stores, and a lot of railroad tracks right here. And there was a school called Lincoln School where the orphans went, and it was only about a block away from the home. And this is Lincoln School, where the children would have went. And this is a church about a block away. And this is the stoneworks. So this is about 1898 when Eva decided to buy this home. And she did it with her sister, Ollie, Ollie Price. So not only did Eva start the first home for black orphans in Illinois, she also became the first black probation officer in Sangamon County. Now, these two roles that she had as matron of the home and as a probation officer were complementary, but they were also um, very different. So you can imagine being in this home trying to help these children and nurture them but also having the role of the probation officer who has to sort of police them and send them to jail or send them to a juvenile detention center. And she was also living at the home. So she was wearing a lot of different hats at that time, which would never happen nowadays with all the laws we have. You know, you would never be able to do all that together. And these are just some examples of children that Eva was dealing with, saying they were incorrigible and recommending that they be sent to a detention center. And one of them was for stealing money. And also, at that time, homelessness was a crime. So seeing a child on the street without a home, she had the ability to put them somewhere. Now, we have a connection with the Dana Thomas House in Springfield. And how many of you have been there? One, two, three, OK. Were you aware that there was a connection? Kind of? Anyone? OK. So around 1904, Eva ran out of money to finance her home. And this woman, uh, Mary Lawrence, who was the wife of um, Mr. Lawrence, who was the former mayor of Springfield, and she was Susan Lawrence Dana's mother. She was a philanthropist, and she decided she was going to keep that home going. But she said, if we do that, I want to tear the whole thing down and start all over again and build a new home. And <clears throat> that's exactly what she did. So this is an original photo of the home. It's a color photo of the home. This is pretty much what it looks like today. They laid the cornerstone in 1904 for this, which is the same year that the Dana Thomas House 
was completed. Now, this is Lawrence Adult Center, which has a Frank Lloyd Wright library inside it. And Frank Lloyd Wright actually designed the library in there. And they used extra bricks from this building at that same time, 1904, to build the Lincoln Colored Home. And this was the original home that sat where the, the Dana Thomas house now sits. And this was the Lawrence's home. And Mary decided she was going to take the furniture out of the home and put it in the Lincoln Colored Home because they were going to get rid of most of this building. And there is the cornerstone you can see in 1904. The cornerstone is no, lo no longer there. The owners removed it because they were afraid of vandalism. <clears throat> Some close-ups of the brickwork. Oops. The wooden doors are original. So originally it had a porch on this side, which is no longer there. It was a brick and wood porch. I was not allowed to go inside the house when I was doing my research, so I had to rely on very few pictures of the inside of the house that I got permission to use. And so you can see the, the beautiful staircase. It had electricity. It had what they called back then um, chair rails right here. It had transom windows. And here you can see the first floor. <clears throat> so Eva's bedroom and bathroom were on the first floor. And this was a kind of a receiving area for visitors here. You can imagine she didn't have much privacy. And this is the second floor. So this would have been mostly bedrooms for the staff and the um, residents there. And then <clears throat> the basement. <clears throat> so in the beginning, Eva had to travel to find people to live at the home because it was a new home. People didn't know about it. And she used the railroads. It was an extensive um, network of railroads around Springfield. And she went to Decatur, Joliet, um, Jacksonville. She went to uh, places in Iowa, Davenport, that she had lived before. And here we have, by 1910, you can see these are the people that she had at the home. And she's listed as matron at the age of 42. She has an assistant matron, age 61, and she has a widow here, 93 years old, and she has some, uh, wow, she has a lot of widows here. One, two, three, four. She has six widows. She's listing herself as a widow because she remarried and she became widowed. And then you can see the breakdown of children. So we have the orphan names, the people who were at the home. Now, this is the only letter, original letter, actual letter, document that I found that was written by Eva. And it's all in her handwriting. And this is from the Dana Thomas House Foundation. And they gave me permission to use it. And this is just an amazing letter that I would love to read to you. And it says, and this is to um, Susan Lawrence. <clears throat> dear, my dear Mrs. Susan Lawrence Jorgendahl, oh, you great big beautiful doll, your announcement came as I was not much surprised. Glad to welcome a new member to our home board. Came home last week and sister, some better, all my charge are well and pray for your safe return again. 
By charge, she means the children at the home. I, it's like dear grandma often said, I had a presentiment of your change now that you are happy because she just, Susan Lawrence had just gotten married. May you and your husband be spared to enjoy the Christ blessing from heaven, hurting as you're doing at any time. I can't, I can't read the whole thing. And may be the same true friendship ever be cemented with love until we cross the bar of justice, there free from the cares of this busy life, and may our life's work shine as brilliant as yours, loved and cherished by all whom your kind and loving hands have aided, like our sainted mother you are to us. Now be happy twice in God's name. I bid you a happy, a long happy life full of sunshine. Yours, Eva. And we have a original picture of the home there too. This is a young Eva. Original photo. So eventually the home was under investigation and under scrutiny because of the social service culture in the United States. They started to go from institutionalizing orphans to wanting to put them in foster care. And so there were, all, there were a lot of different allegations against her to get the home shut down, and she had to deal with a lot. However, the governor went to visit the home, and he thought it was doing great. Here, um, Eva is denying allegations that Southerners were coming to the home to give birth to their biracial babies. They accused, uh, that, was, that was a common accusation that white women would go there because they had a um, biracial baby to keep it secret. Now, this is another letter that the Dana Thomas House Foundation had written by Susan Lawrence complaining about Eva. And th this is another amazing letter because it shines a light on the relationship between this wealthy socialite white woman, Susan Lawrence, and Eva Carol Monroe. And she was accusing Eva of not helping her own race, um, of wanting to be taken care of, and so forth. So 1920, you can see that Eva Monroe is here at age uh, 51, and these are all orphans. They called them inmates back then. Not because, it, back then, if you were in an institution like a hospital or a school, they, call, they just called you an inmate. It had a different meaning then. So she had a lot of children there. So this is a very um, wealthy woman. She was the wife of a railroad magnate, and she, she did a, a study. And she was another person who was trying to shut the home down. She's saying it was, it was, um, it was outdated, the staff were underpaid, it wasn't sanitary. So it got a bad review from her. Nevertheless, Look how many people she's still serving in 1930. This is three years before the home closed. So obviously there was still a need for what she was doing. <clears throat> and they served three meals a day, well-balanced meals. And you can see some of the orphans out front here. This is an interesting newspaper article. One of the orphans escaped, and it said that she was very dark-skinned and poorly dressed. They didn't have a lot of money to, to give the kids really nice clothes. OK, Eva was shut down in 1933. By 1940, she's still living at the home at the age of 71. Her sister is living there with her, and she has some renters living there probably to help her 
financially because she's not getting that financing anymore from Sangamon County because she doesn't have all the orphans there. She was in the Women's Relief Corps, was, which was an auxiliary for the GAR. Very active in that. And she rose up in the ranks of this organization. Here's a, a talk I, I got from her out of a book. And you can see here, uh, I hoped I hope to get another core before we got out of office and we'll keep trying. I'm sure I will succeed. This new core in the name of James H. Lewis will do their duty by him. James, Mr. Lewis was the picture I showed you of the man from Chicago, the Civil War veteran. And this talk uh, sheds light on Eva's ideas about race relations between white and black people. And if you read it, she's saying white and black people need to work together. We need to serve together. We need to fight together. She was also instrumental in the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And I believe she joined this around the age of 19. And part of their mission was to lift, lift up the black race and help the black race. And I think that was part of the reason she started the home. So Eva was about a block away from her home one day on the corner, and it was winter, and two cars collided, and one of them hit her, and she got a head injury. And she stayed at St. John's Hospital for almost the next seven years as an invalid. Her sister, Ollie, took care of her. And then she died in uh, Quincy at a nursing home. <coughs> but she was buried in Springfield. Luckily, we have her there. And her daughter, Beatrice, and her sister, Ollie, helped with the arrangements. And like I said, she did, she did not have a gravestone, so I had contributors from the community. Two of them were funeral directors, and we were able to pay for a stone for her now at Oak Ridge Cemetery. She is buried right beside Ollie Price, her sister. Her uh, father's buried in the cemetery too, but in a different section. Okay, that's all I have. So now we have about... It looks like we have about 20 minutes for question and discussion. And we can pass the mic around. I'm wondering if there was, at the same time, any orphanages in Springfield for, for white children, and was her orphanage looked at with a different standard. Mm. And it was that some of the issues that were part of her shut, the, the orphanage being shut down? Yeah, that's a great question. There were other orphanages here at that time, but it was during segregation, so the orphanages were also segregated. So there would be a white one, there might be a Jewish one, you know, maybe a different religion of one, you know, Native American, it just, um, so, I think you're correct in your assessment that she was treated. She was maybe not getting the same treatment as the other ones, the same resources, yeah. the same confidence, you know. So, yeah, we agree. But it also was a time in, it was a transitional time when they were going from institutionalizing children to try to putting them in foster care, or paying the mothers to keep them at home with government assistance. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I had a question. Now, these children, were they like orphan, orphan, or were they like delinquents? 
How did she come across these children? That's a great question. So a lot of it was because the parents simply could not afford to keep their children. So you would see children there who had parents right there in Springfield who would visit them, but they couldn't keep them. Yeah, that was, that was one of the big things. Yeah, and some of them were just on the street because for, for whatever reasons, they, they truly were homeless. Yeah. Or they were just coming out of a juvenile detention center and they didn't have a home to go to. And some of them stayed with her for like 13 years. Some of them stayed there a long time. Although she did try to place them. She really did try to place them, but you can imagine how hard it was for just her to be doing all this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have one quick question. Um, are you aware that uh, Root History Organization recently purchased the home? No. Yes. <gasps> I was going to ask you what the plans were, but. <laughs> when? Um, Maybe a month or two ago. Oh, that is great news. Yeah. Do you know how much they paid for it? I do not. Do you know what they plan for it? I do not at this oh. point. Yeah. They've actually. I thought done... you might know. <laughs> no, they've actually done a lot of research on the home themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm sure they'll do something great. Yeah, I just learned recently that they finally. I know they had been working on it, and they said they finally were able to purchase it. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is already on the National Register of Historic Places. So that's a good thing. And I know that they won't tear it down. So <laughs> that's great. Thanks for telling me that. Can you stick it into the water? Yeah. Please. It's a. Uh, an African American owned uh, Route 66 site and museum. It's called Route History. We were thinking for a while that the National Park Service would buy it and kind of incorporate it into this Black History corridor on the east side there, but that was just taking forever. Yeah. That's good. Anyone else have comments or questions? One more. Can you um, explain again the connection between Beatrice Trice and, um, and Eva? Yeah, I'm sorry. So Beatrice was Eva's only child. Uh, and, from, and she was from Eva's first marriage to Emmett Trice. <clears throat> she had a troubled childhood. She was getting in trouble with drugs and stealing. And when Beatrice was 15, Eva sent her to basically a reformatory institution in Geneva, Illinois. And it was, a, it was a very rough place to be. It was segregated, too. It was a white female director there, and there were accusations. Um, there she is. That's not actually her, but there were accusations that she was torturing the children, and she actually did have torture instruments wow. there. So she was forced to resign. But Beatrice made it through, and then when she got out, when she was 18, she returned to Springfield for a while, and she met someone and got married, and then they moved to Milwaukee. Okay. Thank you. One other thing, uh, you, you shared some census records, and, and um, it, just from looking at those records, is it, am I correct to say that um, the ratio of um, inmates as they were was um, like maybe 10 to 1 female to males? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if we look here, for instance, at this one, well, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It looks like 12 females and two males early on, but later on it started to balance out. 
But also later on, she started having trouble with the older kids getting together and getting into sexual trouble and pregnancies because they were all living together in that same house. And so she purchased a building right next to the Lincoln Colored Home in hopes of putting the boys in that house. And then the home closed. So that's another thing. There were a lot of sexual scandals there and accusations because everyone was all mixed up. Yeah. Yeah, because this one, it looks like a lot of female again. Now, 1930, we have more males. I have a question for you. Um, and you may have already said it, but I don't remember. Um, about how many children did go through her home over the years? And then when they did shut down, like what exactly was the process? Where did the children who were there go? Mm -hmm. If I had time to do extremely deep and extensive research, I could probably determine the number of children who went through there. But I think it was in the thousands. I, I really do. And once it closed, they tried to place the kids in, mostly in foster care, because institutions just weren't the thing at that time anymore. Yeah. Anyone else? No. Okay, I guess we can wrap it up. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for coming and thank you to our online viewers as well. We will have a book signing directly after this. So if you are interested in purchasing a book and having it signed, um, it will be downstairs on the ground floor in our visitor center. So we can go ahead and head over there and please remember to fill out your surveys as well. And again, thank you to our sponsors, WGLT, Illinois Humanities, and our partners with the Bloomington Public Library. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.